Welcome to the Old Soul, New Soul Astrology Podcast. Thomas Miller along with Robert Glasscock. We love your questions. You can leave us one up at the top of the funastrology.com website. There's an orange button at the top left. If you click on that, you don't even have to leave your name or email. You can do it anonymously and we'll tackle it just like this. Hi there. In, um, on the 15th of November 2022, somebody else asked a similar question about uh, cusps, about a sign being on the cusp of a house and then the rest of that house um, at some point being in another sign. What I don't feel was addressed is the question of planets in the next sign, not the cusp sign, not the sign on the cusp of the house, but the next sign that ha- happens in, within the house, planets that are in that sign and how they would be interpreted in a house. So let's say Aquarius is on the cusp, and then there are planets in Pisces in that house. How would Pisces planets in a house that has Aquarius on the cusp be interpreted? Thank you. I love this question, uh, and I love the questioner for asking it because I can hear her mind. Everybody can hear her mind. Here's what I'm seeing in this chart. It's got Aquarius on this house but here's this planet in that house and it's in pisces as you know thomas from my workshops there's a mantra that i have make something out of everything you see in astrology so she has noticed that a particular house is ruled by aquarius Now, one of the ways that I think about the house cusps is that they are external. They are conditioning that is imposed on us from birth regarding each house matter. So this person was born with an Aquarian conditioning to everything having to do with the mind, thinking, relating to siblings, communicating, reading, writing, studying, all the mental and communicative faculties, they're conditioned by the unexpected and unstable elements, Aquarian elements in their environment to react to their mental acuity and so on in an Aquarian way. And yet they have this planet in Pisces in that house, which is a completely different archetype. Pisces is an emotional water sign. And I forget, did she mention a planet, Thomas, that no, was in Pisces? No, but as we are recording this right now, Aquarius is sitting on the cusp of the seventh house, and Saturn is in Pisces at five degrees. We have the chart up for you. It's in the show notes if you'd like to take a look at it. Do you want to use that one? Then we could, absolutely. If this were a birth chart for a person, they would be conditioned in life to get divorced simply because Aquarius is on the seventh cusp. That predis taken alone, don't even look at anything else. It predisposes toward a couple of things. One, depending on the the, uh, state of the condition of Saturn and Uranus in the chart, they may never get married at all. But assuming that they do, the Aquarian there conditions them to expect what they will look for are compelling relationships, people who come into their lives that really strike a very deep chord with them, Saturn and Pisces, in the seventh, but on the eighth. And that absolutely has to do with sex, the eighth house. So when you're younger and the hormones are raging and so on, they'll be looking for this kind of compelling attraction that feels very karmic, and it is very karmic. And it will be very intense and powerful. The odds are they would get married. Saturn is in Pisces, a fertile sign. The moon is in Cancer, another fertile sign. With Mars in Cancer, another fertile sign. So the likelihood Saturn rules the seventh house in Chaldean astrology. Saturn rules Aquarius. It's trying those Cancer planets. So but all of that's very fertile. Saturn, nonetheless, is in Pisces. And that suggests that at some point during the marriage, trust and betrayal will be challenging elements to the marriage. And they will be predisposed to get divorced. And yet divorce is not what they want. They're a Taurus son. They want it to last. 
The moon is in Cancer with Mars. They want a home and family, and they want it to last. And, and it probably will because of the trine to Saturn. Nonetheless, uh, you can see the Pluto squaring the sun there. And the sun rules this querent, rules her first house, let's say. In Taurus, it squares Pluto. That usually indicates one of two things. It can be the loss of a partner through death, sometimes, or it can simply mean a divorce, the end of, of and which will be very upsetting and traumatic for a person like this, because they really are. When they say, I love you, and they say, let's get married, they mean it till death's who is part. And when they, when it doesn't happen, it really can be devastating, even though Taurus, Sun, Cancer, Moon, they will carry on. They'll be okay. But it changes them forever. So that's the way I think of these things. When you have a sign on the the cusp, that tells you how you've been condemned. Maybe you saw divorce in your early background. Or maybe you were born into a family that you really didn't like. You didn't like the way they behaved. You didn't like any of them. So you just wanted to get away from them. Because Aquarius also has a loner side to it. And then you have Saturn and Pisces in that house which again, pre, it, it shows a tremendous amount of empathy and compassion and even an attraction to people in trouble because you can help them. This woman can help them. So this can be one of those classic indications of uh, a, a woman who saves, let's say, a war veteran, a vet who comes back injured or handicapped in some way. And he is withdrawn because he thinks he's unlovable. But she could see through that and absolutely give him love and care and have a wonderful relationship with someone that somebody else might think isn't worth it, you see. Fascinating chart. I love her question about look at the difference between what's on the cusp and what's in the house. Different sides. And you do have to work through. It's like a puzzle. Every time you read a chart, you're trying to figure it out. What does it mean? And I love how her mind is already there. She's spotted it. She said, wait a minute. Here's a sign on the cusp, but there's this other different sign in this planet that's in that house. What does that mean? I love that kind of probing mentality. Good for her. All right. Good. I like the you, if you've ever played golf with somebody that is really an avid stickler to the PGA rules, even if you're just out with four guys having a fun afternoon. <laughs> but no, what's the one rule that you has to be subscribed? Play it where it lies. True. Well, that's the way you do this. You read it the way it lies. That is Saturn in the seventh house in Pisces. And you do what you just did and you interpret it that way. I love this. Make something out of everything you see, because what she just saw and noticed and asked a question about is her own mind saying, think this through, make something out of this. There is something to be made out of this interpretively. See, that's what I love about her mind, because she just she spotted that difference and wants to know how does that work. And the fact is, they both work. The difference is that one of them is external conditioning about those house matters. The other one is an internal energy archetype that you have. If it's Mars, it's the archetype of action and so on. So the planets are inner energies, archetypes of different kinds of energies that we have. The sun is the life force, for example. But the houses are external conditioning. Very interesting. Glad now, she brought that to us. Another point here is let's talk about the house systems that we're that you're reading from is the equal house system. A lot of people today are using whole sign. That's experienced a tremendous revival. I've come to love the equal system, and you've uh, pointed out, and it is absolutely true that you do get an accuracy with it that it just doesn't show up in the others. But when we start talking about Placidus and all the other time-based systems, you can have intercepted signs. So that's basically three signs in one house. I don't like looking at those charts anymore, to be honest with you. But how do you handle that? Any difference? Or is there, you know, one of the other discussions on that, Robert, too, is that intercepted signs are maybe less influential in the life. What do you think about this? 
Well, I'll tell you, uh, it's like anything else to me with astrology. When I got into this, I started out with Placidus because everybody did. And that's what the books that I had did. And then I guess about uh, three or so years into this, I met Linda Goodman and she uh, used equal houses. So, of course, I tried them. And I was one of those guys. I had an intercepted moon in Placidus. But in equal houses, my moon in Aries fell in my third house. No interceptions. And it worked out for me because I do indeed have a mole marker scar on my left cheek. Here's what we get with the houses. In a man's chart, the odd houses are the left side of the body and the even houses are the right side of the body. In a woman's chart, it's reversed. So for me, that was a physical fact that I could not ignore. But then as I kept reading, I noticed all of the books, when they would deal with interceptions, they made it very complex. Oh, that meant this house matters was extremely complex and yada, yada, yada. And, and then they would go up when you're in, born in the high latitudes, like if you're born an Eskimo in Alaska, that, you know, yeah, you'll have more interceptions. And just think of it, they, you know, their lives are so different. And I'm reading this thinking, no, they're not. They may use blubber for money, but it's still the second house. I don't care what you use for money, cash, paper dollars, whale blubber, clamshells, it doesn't matter. It's an exchange of values for some symbolic object that represents value, like money. So the Eskimos don't live any differently than we do. They just have a different, uh, it looks different. And I began to think that's true in all aspects of life. I don't care where you're born, high latitudes, lower latitudes, you still have relatives. You still have what, what amounts to a home, a sense of home and family in the fourth house and so on. And then as I kept watching these ever more tortured descriptions of interceptions and different house systems and so on, I thought, you know, Linda, bless her quadruple Aries heart, and she learned it from her teacher, Lloyd Cope in New York. I thought, yeah, she's right. It's simpler. It's a lot cleaner. And philosophically, it works. There aren't there are not any differences between me born at the equator and you born in Nome, Alaska. We've still got somebody over us at work, and that's the 10th house. We've still got money to handle, and that's the second house. It's no different. So I just uh, I've stopped bothering. Well, let me other. ask you this on that point. Yeah. The other, the other than the accuracy and what you experienced was when you met Equal over Placidus, all of a sudden something that occurred on your body after you were born became relevant, and it became accurate. What about whole sign? Why not just move that ascendant to zero degrees at the first house and keep it all even? It wouldn't be the same necessarily. But why do that? Look at what you lose. Yeah, that, that's what I'm wondering. Sign. So Look at what you lose when you use whole signs. So what equal does, just for people who don't understand, is it puts the ascendant point as the cusp of the first house and then each house is 30 degrees, so it is the cusp of every other house, and they are all equally spaced. That's equal sign. So and then what your midheaven falls either in the ninth house or in the tenth house. It, it's just it, you treat the midheaven like a point because you're right, you got the same degree, just different signs on all the house cusps, but then the midpoint is treated just like a planet. It's stuck in either the ninth house, it may fall on that side, or it may fall in the tenth. So what's the advantage of the equal? The advantage of the equal to me was just the flat out accuracy. First of all, with the mole marker scar on the left side of my head or face, not the right, because in Placidus, it would have been in the second house and on the right cheek, and it isn't. And then <laughs> when Linda was showing me how to determine the genders of children in order, which I did for this uh, big workshop for Kepler a few years ago, using Donald Trump's chart to show how to do it. Uh, that, again, if the genders of the children are wrong, then maybe I would try a different house system, but they're not. Now, it's not as easy as some people like to make it, but true enough, it works. That's the only reason I, it's the only reason I use anything, Thomas. I've got Mercury and Jupiter in Virgo. I started out as a skeptic. Certainly by now, I'm not skeptical at all, but I'm still a pretty much show me guy. If you've got a better method, show me. You know, I, I if just going to tell me something's true. Show me. I just put Robert's chart up in whole sign as we're we talking here. <laughs> we don't want this. He says because no. it moves that Aries moon into the fourth house. All right, then that would be on my right cheek. A right cheek. 
So that just invalidated that accuracy. And the point, I guess, that I'm making is you've done just shy of some 60,000 readings. Who's counting? (laughs) Over 60 (laughs) years. And you see that accuracy factor come up over and over and over. Have you ever had to apologize for an equal chart? Mm -hmm. No, Mm -hmm. never. Mm -hmm. That's pretty amazing. I'll fix this as soon as we get <laughs> I have to have both hands to get it back the way it was. <laughs> well, that is uh, a great reason. And I know a lot of people who have been listening to this podcast now, especially the ones who have been using other house systems, they're slowly starting to experiment with. Well, you know, Thomas, too, let me remind everybody and, and you, because you've been in these workshops. I tell everybody we all have three charts. We have a time birth chart from a birth certificate with a, an actual ascendant in midheaven. We have the natural wheel, which begins with zero Aries, and you just plug in your natal planets. And then we have the solar chart, which is where you set your chart up, but you place the sun at the first cusp and read that chart. And it's astonishing how much more information you will get from each one. The solar chart is very valuable to read. So is the natural wheel chart. It's amazing. See, in the natural wheel, I have moon in the Aries in my third at birth, as you see. But in the natural wheel, I have the moon in Aries rising. And that gives it much more prominence. And, and the moon in Aries can be a wonderful sign. Tact and diplomacy are not part of it. And unfortunately, I'm... A Libra. So I've had to learn because my tendency is to blurt out what I think without thinking and then repent in leisure at what I just said. Do you know what I mean? So I've had to learn to do that, but I have learned it. But this is true for every time. But nonetheless, the physical facts are really what convinced me. So I just haven't bothered with any other house system since because they, as you see here, didn't work. Well, and the other amazing thing is that it works with horary. Well, see, it, it, the reason I use it still is philosophically. I do not believe that somebody born far above the equator or far below the equator has any different arrangements of houses than I do. We all deal with the same things, employers, co-workers, health, spouses, home, family, all of it. It's, it's Again, maybe I use whale blubber instead of dollar bills, but it's the same thing. It's the same house. So that's why I just have it. And, you know, I don't know, but at some point, at least with me, I just kind of got tired of listening to all of the different arguments because you can wind up spending your whole life arguing and never reading charts. And I've learned to trust what worked for me. And I did. I mean, I tried everything. That's why I tried Equal Houses. When Linda Goodman said she used it, who am I? (laughs) <laughs> to say, oh, well, I'm not going to. So, of course, I wanted to try it. And by George, I saw what she meant. I'd like to go back to the techie side for a second, entertain my Mercury conjunct Jupiter in Sagittari- and Sagittarius side for a second here. Putting that ascendant point as the cusp of the first house, technically, what does that do? Okay, I guess you're talking about in relation to whole signs? Yes, the, all right, whole signs don't use the ascendant. So you miss out by not placing the ascendant at the first cusp with whole signs. You miss out on every other planetary relationship to that individual point, which presumably is your accurate time of birth. Now, you may have to rectify a chart to get it, but nonetheless, that is the point you are. That's what all the house systems were devised around is trying to reach. And in any house system, you still got the same midheaven and the same ascendant. But with whole signs, you're, you're led away from considering the ascendant as as predominant as it in fact is in a life so you're missing to me a ton of information just to conform to somebody saying whole sign is the, the oldest or whatever they they claim about it i don't find it uh, useful at all because of this fact that it begins to de-emphasize points of the horoscope that i think are incredibly important like the ascendant You know, one thing I when I was doing readings, I would tell people I like to look at both. Sometimes I would definitely look at both because you do get another breadth and depth. And maybe somebody is bringing something up that 
well, you know, like we were just saying, that Saturn in the 8th might make a little bit more sense, and we need to spend some time with that. Or there are some characteristics that we could explore. You know, this is one of the marvels of astrology, is that it really, there are so many different ways that you can slice it and dice it. And like we said in the last episode, that, my goodness, you could even roll it all back one constellation, and some people can make hay from that. So it really is truly amazing. Well, you know, the thing that uh, impressed me about Linda, for example, in whole, uh, excuse me, Equal Houses, uh, when she said that she was, she also told me she was in L.A. then staying at the Hollywood Roosevelt writing her second book, and she was not seeing any clients. And she asked me, we're sitting in the Snow White Cafe having coffee, and she said, would you mind if I referred clients to you? Because I'm not saying, of course, I'm whatever, I'm 25, 24, um, totally flattered. I said, my God, I'd be high. Well, she sent me one, exactly one. But what a great client. Uh, and she was a uh, the wife of the leading neurosurgeon at, at UCLA at the time. And I remember when she came over and and she was a Scorpio and had on a wig and sunglasses. I loved her. And I said to her, let me ask a couple of questions just to see if this time of birth is accurate. Your first child was a girl, and she snapped at me. That's right. And I'm thinking to myself, well, of course, 50-50. She wasn't impressed. But the second one, I looked at her sixth house for her second pregnancy, and I said, this one is really confusing. Did you lose a did you have twins and lose one at birth? And she gasped and took her sunglasses off and said, I cannot believe that you can see that. So inwardly, I was jumping up and down. Linda was right. This method works. Externally, I was trying to keep a straight face, <laughs> which I managed to do. But those kinds of, those are physical facts that you can't argue with. So, uh, you know, somebody comes along and says, I prefer a whole science, fine, have a ball. I'm using this because I know it works for me. But I tell everybody, and you know this, Thomas, please try everything that you're interested in and and discard the things that don't work for you. Maybe you'll come back to them or maybe you'll just leave them alone forever. But but. To try everything and see what you get the best results. I don't like to use a lot of charts for a single anything. I have a pretty uh, set workflow. I use the natal chart. I use the transits to the natal chart. And I use solar and converse solar arcs to the natal chart. And the fourth thing I use is what's called a consultation chart, which is a kind of combination of orary and natal. And that's all I use. There's a whole module on it in the horary course, yes, section there nine. Is. <laughs> there is. <laughs> Tell you how to use it. You know who Johnny Cash is, I would imagine. Yes, indeed. You know his daughter, boy Roseanne. Named Sue. Yeah, boy named Sue. Folsom Prison Blues. I walk the line. Ring of Fire. <laughs> on and on. Right. And his daughter, Roseanne Cash, and she made a pretty good mark in music of her own self in the in the eighties and nineties, in particular. When Johnny died, they had a memorial at the Ryman that was televised, of course. And in her tribute to her dad, she said that one night she was lying in bed reading a book, and he walked in and said, what are you reading? And she handed the book to him, and it was about astrology. She said, I would imagine that you're probably not interested in that, are you? And he said, no, but I think you should learn everything you can about it. Good for him. And she said that pivoted her own, that moment right there pivoted her own way of parenting when she became a parent. No, but learn everything you can about it. And that really applies here is what you've been saying in this episode and the last one is learn everything about all of it. And then you formulate what works consistently for you. And you'll see the patterns as it unfolds. That's great. Well, and I love this idea of make something out of everything you see. So if you see, as we just had that question about, there's this sign on the house cusp, but there's this planet in the house in a different sign. You notice something. You're supposed to ask yourself, what does this mean? And begin to think it through, you know? And you may make your own discoveries as you go, probably will. You probably will. I, I don't know why I happened to notice pretty early on 
that the degrees of a planet in the birth chart corresponded to ages where that planet's archetype was going to be dominant in the life. And I didn't read it anywhere. To me, it just was obvious. But I've had people over the years say, God, you discovered, I don't think I discovered anything. It's always there. It's just something I happen to notice. And multiples of those d- degrees. To the point, for example, Thomas, where I have Uranus and Gemini retrograde in my sixth house. That's accidents, among other things. It's also motor, motorcycles, cars, and bikes, and the motorbikes. And well, at 13, which is the degree it is, I, got, I begged my father for a moped so I could have a paper route, right? And I got one for Christmas. And I also got my Social Security card that same year to have that paper out. Here I am on a motorbike, Uranus and Gemini, throwing newspapers, Gemini. And getting my social security card, Uranus and Gemini in my sixth house of work. That was my first paying job. And then that archetype, you multiply by two, age 26. What happened? I was in this incredible car accident as a passenger in which I had my first out-of-body experience as the car was thrown and rolling over into traffic. I thought, oh, here's where I die and just instantly was 30 feet up over the car. That was an eye-opener. At age 26, the Uranus archetype times two, the degree. So those things are there in the chart. And if you notice them, you're meant to ask, what does it mean? Absolutely. Thank you so much for this. Great question and great answer. If you'd like to know more, if you'd like to talk with Robert, if you'd like to check out the horary course, or if you're a little bit more beginner level, we have the Fun Astrology 101 course. We have the whole package for you, and all of that information is in the show notes where you can check it out. Go uh, find out about our YouTube channel and especially where the conversation continues in our Discord channel. It's all there. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next time on the Old Soul, New Soul Astrology Podcast with Robert Glasscock. 